Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid Christ alone, church. Amen. Isn't it good in this time? Uh, now, seriously, I want you to take your pastor. I want you to listen just a minute. I know you're going to be getting online and commenting and saying good morning, but as we get started, isn't it good to know that in all of the craziness around us and all of the different opinions that are coming at us left and right, that we can make the one choice, one choice, and it's guaranteed to be the right choice in Christ alone. Amen. And amen. Good morning. Good morning, church. I am thankful to be with you today as are uh, Jessica and Jarius as we are together once again. And just to be with you and to know that we are sharing in the love of the Lord is an important thing to us and it lifts us up. Amen. Uh, a few announcements as we get started. Let's see. Our bishop has said, uh, according to my last email, that we were going to open, and a few people did open on the 5th, but they uh, immediately gave uh, an advisory to shut back down because of the spiking in Knoxville and Sevierville and Sevier County. So it looks like August, the, the first part of August now. Uh, they keep pushing it back, and, and it's frustrating, but certainly we want everybody to be safe. I want you to know, uh, just as we, I think, shared with you last week, we have done what is required of us. We are prepared. We are ready uh, to prepare the church uh, for return. But more than all, wherever we are, stay safe and stay in the Lord. Amen and amen. Take a deep breath with me this morning. And, you know, I think some of you have been cheating, but this deep breath does two things. It allows us to take a moment and to calm ourselves and to clear our minds and our hearts. I hope it does that. It also lets you do a little corona test at home. They say if you can't hold your breath for 10 seconds, you need to check it. So let's say this. Take a deep breath. Hold it in. Let it out slowly. Breathe in Christ. Breathe out your trials, your tribulations, your concerns, and your fears. Amen? Amen. And as has always been our habit, if you will, our plan, our desire, and our hope, was to allow the flame to remind you and I be a, an ever-burning symbol of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen and amen. Would you pray with me the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to share? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine are the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. 
Church, if you would, and most of you know this by memory, if not, I, <laughs> it's been so long, I can't remember what page this is on in the hymnal, but I think most of you can find it. If not, you certainly uh, can uh, remember it with me. Let's together recite our reason for believing as we share together with the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You know, church, that's a pretty easy thing to read and to understand, but it, it never fails uh, to amaze me. I still get questions. Pastor, does this mean we are Catholic? <laughs> no, that's the little c, Catholic. That means worldwide church, not the Roman Catholic church. Uh, but the creed is what we proclaim to believe. And my prayer this morning, church, is that every time you have read it, said it, thought it, recited it, whatever, that you truly took the time and that moving forward, you will always take the time to understand what it is that you're saying because that's really important. I promise, I promise you, that's important. Know what it is you're saying. Know what it is you're singing. Know that it is perfect to the sight of the Lord. And if it's not, put it aside. Because today's message will, I hope, share with you something that is so important. Today's message could be titled, Whose Armor Are You Putting On Before You Go Into Battle? Amen? And amen. And you know, so often in our entire lives, there are things that come upon us as battles. Uh, mine sometimes are, you know, silly. Uh, I left my phone on top of my car by the time I got to Sevierville. I don't know why it wasn't on top of the car anymore. I've done that. But boy, it became a battle to get my communication back up. Finances, health, all of those can come against us as battles. But you know what? If we are armored in the whole armor of God, those battles will not overcome us. No, the one that is within us will see us through the other side. Amen? Amen. Amen. Today's scripture is a really long one. So, you know, if you need to, go get another cup of coffee. Get a cup of coffee. If you don't have your Bible with you, write down 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. And I'm going to read it to you. And because it is so long, I may stop at a few places and we may uh, discuss that. Those of you that are taking notes, if I mispronounce one of these cities or one of these names, go, well, pastor, we're praying for you. But if you find out the right pronunciation, send me a text, send me an email. I'm always willing to learn, amen? Uh, if you've turned in your Bible, 1 Samuel 17, and church, listen, we will get back. We will get through this Old Testament. I'm just gonna hit the high spots. But it's important to me as your pastor to continue to learn where the New Testament came from. I know Jesus Christ. I got that part right. I learned that a long time ago, but I am continually amazed to see how people have been thinking about it all this time. Last week, why in the first century, 
the rabbis were talking about the sticks on Isaac's back being so close to the carrying of a cross. Now they didn't know Jesus. If they were reading uh, the Torah, I guess they knew what was to come, but they compared that to carrying your own cross to crucifixion. That was important stuff. It was a foreshadowing of the covenant that we now enjoy with the Lord Jesus Christ. This week, further down into the Old Testament, we may get back to Exodus and stuff, but this week we're in Samuel. You know, one of the things, and it, it'll be shared uh, in the scripture today or next week, that uh, from the time Adam and Eve were, you know, made by God and put into the Garden of Eden, every generation since has moved farther away from the one that can, farther away. We, we got more and more, uh, we've become more and more defiled and uh, degraded and, and uh, wanting of the things of the world. And that's what led to G uh, Noah, right? And the flood, because the Lord became so distressed that the people that he had created had moved so far from him. But let's, today we're in Samuel, 1 Samuel 17. This is about David and that old big guy that he took on named Goliath. Would you hear the word of, the, of God and, and be with me? Like I said, it's long. So hopefully I've, I've talked enough for you to get your other cup of coffee or your tea or whatever, and now you're settled in. Open your Bibles. <clears throat> and I'd ask that you just lay your hand on your Bible and pray with me. Father God, we are asking today, not just me, Lord, but individually and collectively, the entire church, that the meditations of our hearts and the utterances of our mouth are pleasing to you today, now, and forever, my rock and my redeemer. Amen and amen. Mine says, the title says, David and Goliath. I know you all know the story. We're just gonna take it apart today and hopefully you will come to know it a little better or to remember something that maybe you have forgotten. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Sokol, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sokol and Ezekiah in Ephrath Damon. That's Ephrath Damon. Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, or Elah, and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side and a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Well, according to my math, that means he was over nine feet tall. That's pretty big. In our lifetimes, we've known of several humans that have been well in excess of seven and eight feet, but says that he was bigger than nine. Says he had a helmet of bronze on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels, 5,000 shekels of bronze. Well, a thousand shekels, according to my research, is about 25 pounds. So it's saying that he was carrying just in his breastplate armor, 125 pounds. Whew. It says that he had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. That means that just the tip of his spear was 15 to 20 pounds. 
and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man so that we might fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son of a who, Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, who was named Jesse. And Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three eldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. The names of these three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shamrock. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine, we've heard 40 days before, haven't we church? For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Now church, I'm gonna paraphrase the next bit. So if you will forgive me for that, you continue reading it. I promise I am gonna be so close, but if I miss it, you can let me know, okay? So Jesse said to his son, David, he said, take for your brothers some food. Go to the front lines where they are, take some food. And as well as feeding your brothers, take this lot of cheese, if you will, and give it to their commander so that all will have something to refresh them. And David went, knowing that his most important part of this journey was to come back to his father with news on how his brothers were. Amen? How's the battle going? How are your brothers? <laughs> now Saul, King Saul, he and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David went and did what he did. He found the front line. He found them and he walked up to his brothers to ask how they were going. And it was at that point, church, that he saw and others shared with him that Goliath was standing against the entire army shouting, hey, send someone, anyone, your best man, send him against me. We don't need these two battle lines to fight. I'm a Philistine, you're a follower of Saul, whoever wins claims the victory, amen? Well, David turned to, to his brother and his brother said, what are you, you know, basically, what are you doing here, you little weasel? Did you just come to see the battle? What happened to those sheep that you've been watching? Why are you even here? I wonder if he felt any different when David said, well, you know, I brought you something to eat and I, you know, uh, dad wanted to know how you are. But his brother turned against him even then. He said, I know you're conceited, talking about David, you little, you know, you little whelp. This is men's work. His own brother put David down. So David turned around him and uh, away from him and said, what? I can't even talk? <laughs> Don't I even have that ability? I can even come and share? So he turned to someone else, another soldier, and he asked what was going on? And the soldier says, whomever will approach and defeat Goliath, this is a, a, a good part, I think. Yeah, I don't know if it's the most important part, but he said, whoever will approach and defeat Goliath, not only will the king make rich, he will give to him his daughter in marriage, and also you'll never have to pay taxes in Israel. That's what it says in the scripture. 
So, you know, David probably had uh, a little bit of incentive there, but church, don't think that was what drove David to listen to the Lord. And you know, we're gonna get back on David in a, a week or two probably, because when you and I start to feel unworthy before God, don't forget church, David was an adulterer, really, really a murderer, you know? Uh, he was known to uh, dance, but God said, this is a man after my heart. So you see, whatever sins have been in your life, whatever you have done, wherever you have been, God promises if you but repent and turn to him that it will be as if you never sinned before. But that's another, that's another sermon. We'll get that to later. So David says, well, huh, I'll go. And, and this other soldier runs up and tells his boss and his boss tells his commander and his commander tells Saul's assistant and it gets back to Saul and Saul says, well, yeah, bring that young man to me. And he did. Now listen to this from the word. David said to Saul, this is in 31. I'll back up one line, 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and Saul and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him, meaning Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you're just a boy. And he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. That was really a blessing. He did not mean for David to leave at that point. He was blessing, blessing him. So what comes next is Saul took David over to another part of the tent probably, and he said, here's my armor. It's yours for the battle. And he immediately, it says Saul, immediately put his tunic and started to dress David in the armor. And it said, as he was buckling the sword, the king's sword that was just given to him for this battle, it said that David started to walk around and he came back and he said, hey, uh, king, I'm sorry, but uh, I cannot walk. I cannot move about, it says, in your armor. And he took it off and left it in the tent. So David removed them, meaning the clothing. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi, the creek, the river, and put them in his shepherd's bag in a pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Now let's, let's make sure we're all on the same page. The king tried to dress him in his armor to prepare him for what they saw battle as the time, at that time. You all wore armor into battle. But David said, hey, doesn't fit me. I can't walk around in it. Now, church, that just does not mean that David felt like, well, I need, if I had this to fit me. No, no, no. He's saying that Saul what you find as armor is nothing to my God. Amen? 
I'm going to tell you a little story before we go any further. You know, after all of this, and I'm not giving anything away. I'm sure you all have read it as well. As well. After all of this, and we'll get to the ending here in a minute, but after it all, something happened to King Saul and his armor. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So David took his stones, put them in a pouch, got his sling ready. I guess he just had on a tunic and some sandals. That's what I would think. And, and he walked out to meet, says he drew near to the Philistine. Now hear this. The Philistine came and on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of them. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? It says that he took his staff, right? With sticks, the Philistine, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me, this is important church, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this very day. The Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all that assemble may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hand. It goes on to say, church, that the Philistine took a step or two toward David, walking in all of his armor with all of his might and all of his height. And it says that David ran toward the Philistine. No hesitation. And it says, as he ran, he took a stone from his pouch, loaded his sling, and let it loose to strike Goliath. Smack on the forehead. And it knocked Goliath down, knocked him out, enough that David was able to come upon Goliath, take Goliath's sword, kill him, and remove his head. Now, church, some of us are probably going, eh, I wonder if there really was a Goliath. Were there giants? Well, we know that that certainly could happen. Uh, David was probably five feet, five and a half feet. You know, I'm sure it looked like a giant to him. But you see, already, already, the entire army of King Saul had given up because they'd been there afraid to approach for it says 40 days. Yet David coming from tending the flock says, your armor doesn't work for me, King. I have a different armor. Huh. He didn't say that, but that's what he believed. And uh, that's what he went on to use, that different armor. What was that armor? What is that armor? What is it about facing giants that causes you and I so much concern? Why is it that when we're faced by a mountain, faced by a dawning need, faced by a hill, what is it that still even today convinces you and I that we can do it on our own? We've got our own armor, we can. When we're facing those giants, do we ever even think about the fact that you and I do not have to face them alone? My dad was a great man, he was. Uh, 
just a great dad, great man and a great dad. And I'll remember a lesson that uh, he shared with me early on. He said, son, you know, if you look at somebody that is totally muscled up, you know, big and brawny and uh, sculpted and cut and all of that, I doubt my daddy used those words, but he said bulked up with muscle. He said, yes, he may have strength, but a really good, uh, some of y'all may not follow boxing, but you know, a really good middleweight could take care of that giant of a man who is all muscled up because that muscle is a weight and when they get so bulked up, it slows them down. Whereas a lean middleweight can dance around, get him here, get him there, and can actually overcome that strength. So that's probably not the best analogy, but I think it certainly helps you to understand David went against a man that was carrying 100 plus pounds of armor and was bigger than life in a sack <laughs> with a stone and a slingshot. So what is it that drives you and I and church, I'm not trying to be hard on you. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. What is it that drives you and I to wallow uh, and hide in fear because we're facing a giant? Hear me, church, because I love you. Hear me. We're not really saying, I'm afraid of that giant as much as we say, I'm not trusting in the Lord. Because David chose to trust in the Lord. David chose to have God's presence and his strength as his armor. And no matter what we have today, no matter how high we have piled our treasures, no matter how many warehouses that we have full, it's not gonna protect your health. It's not going to be really be able to go with you anywhere because it's all stacked up over in a warehouse. But David chose to move as one who was light, but with the greatest armor you could ever have. Why are we so ready to support someone else as they try to armor up to fight our battles? The king, who I am sure spent tons of money on his armor. It had to be the best. It had to be the flashiest. It had to be everything you could put to as a positive for armor, if you will. But David said, that's nothing to me. That will be nothing but a hindrance. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. I don't need it, it doesn't fit, I don't feel comfortable in it, I can't walk in it. Well, if you extrapolate that, church, what we're talking about is I cannot walk in the things of man because it's going to weigh me down. I would rather walk in the grace and the mercy and the strength of God, light as a feather, but stronger, as my grandmother would say, stronger than snuff. Amen? Now, both King Saul and that Philistine Goliath thought, David, you're overmatched and underarmored. Even the very people he was fighting for thought, oh, this is not going to end well. <laughs> And to a worldly seasoned warrior like Goliath, David's armor seemed anemic to say the best because he had none. And to the outside observer, uh, you would think that it would leave him defenseless, leave David defenseless. But it says that as Saul was coming toward him, David didn't hesitate. He ran toward Goliath, loading as he ran so that he might do the work of God, not on his own, but lifted up with that hedge of protection, if you will, facing an enemy of, of Israel, 
an enemy of the Israelites, an enemy of God, with just God and a stone. Whew. I tell you what, that really, really uh, moves me because church, what protected David was an ancient and well-tested armor. Amen? They all knew about God. They knew how strong God was. They knew that they were the chosen, yet they stood and trembled in fear because there was a, a man bigger than them who was shouting out to them, come, send me your best. And it says that they, the Israelites, were afraid. Wouldn't it be something if you and I could have the belief in our lives today that David had that morning to face the giants. Now, I want you to hear this again. I, I read it earlier, but this is what David said. I'm gonna jump back to this scripture because it's important. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts goes on to say, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear for the battle is the Lord's, amen. You know, the armor of God that we talk about, huh? you know, the armor and the wisdom of God may be uh, weak and foolish to others, but to you and I that know God, that have allowed God to work and walk with us in our lives. We know that he has seen us through the toughest times. He has allowed us not to fear when giants are in front of us. He has said, I'll never forget you, nor will I forsake you. He is the God of all times, the God of our lives. He provides the armor that you and I need. Now, let me tell you, just uh, jump a, a little ahead. A little later in, in the Bible and in Samuel, it says that Saul once again went up against the Philistine. <clears throat> and it says the Philistines overpowered. And they had a complete victory. And not only did they kill Saul's sons, but they killed Saul. Once they had learned that they had killed the king of the Israelites, they stripped his armor and they took that armor and they put it in one of their temples, basically as a way to say, hey, our God is better than your God. But what they were really saying, church, is that Saul, you stepped away from God. So only then were we able to defeat you. So David's armor, amen, God himself, and Saul's armor both became evangelistic tools. One for the Philistine, that is David's armor, them showing it off that, hey, we beat your God. But the other with David, so that you and I would come to know the man Christ, Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the savior of all that will come to him. So I asked you this, go to Isaiah really quick, flip it over there, Isaiah 54 and 17. It says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So I asked you again, whose armor will you wear today? Whose armor have you chosen to protect you when it's your turn to face the giant? Whose armor will you wear away today? I can't help but share this with you, church. This is from the New Testament. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. When you've done everything else you can do, just stand with and for God. Amen. Stand therefore having your loins girded about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherever, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God, stronger than any weapon. The word of God, the greatest protector. The word of God. Jesus is in it. Amen? From the beginning. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication of all the saints. Put on the armor of God. Stand strong in the face of the giants. Know that none can come against you and overcome you as long as God is in you. I don't know how many times in my life I've talked about, Father, give us a hedge of protection. I don't even know where that came from. But every day, I go to the Lord. I give myself as fallen and weak. And I ask for his strength to see me through the day. And you know what, church? I want to tell you, I, that's been a prayer of mine for years and years and years. Lord, just give me the strength for this day. You know, because the scripture says, don't worry about tomorrow. Amen. Just give me the strength for this day. But you know, church, my prayer has changed a little bit. Now my prayer has gone to praise. Lord, thank you for your strength that in my time of weakness, your strength will see me through because it has. I can tell you innumerable times that but for the strength of the Lord, I would have fallen. My head would have been cut off. My armor would have been stripped away if I had gone against what I was facing, what giant I was facing without allowing God to be my armor, to be my rock, and to be my redeemer. Amen. I want to go ahead and pray. I know I've put this a little bit backwards, but I want to pray today. And church, I want you to join me in prayer. I want you to pray for Mark and Liz because Mark recently lost his mother and he had lost his father uh, you know, six weeks ago in a very short time. So it's been a span, short span. <clears throat> I was able to talk to Mark and his family. They're up in New Jersey and uh, to pray with them. I would ask that you keep uh, my friend Shay, uh, uh, that's a boy's name, Shay, uh, keep him in your prayers because uh, what he thought has started out as colitis. Now they're going to have to remove uh, his kidney. Uh, they believe it's about 90% eaten up with cancer. So pray for Shay. And church, I would ask that uh, you pray for another Mark who is Gracie Sue's principal's husband who uh, is very, very ill with COVID in uh, Blount County in the Maribel uh, area. And, and keep Paul and Celeste in your prayers. Paul, because he is going forth uh, and, and having his knee uh, done uh, this week. Uh, I believe it's the 19th. And after that happens, Celeste still has, to, has her doctors and stuff. So we're gonna have a time in that middle of struggle 
uh, maybe even helping getting Celeste where she needs to uh, go to if Sherry is working or whatever. And so as a church, I have assured her that myself, uh, you know, I can drive. I'm not a good driver, but I'll get you there and back. But reach out in prayer for Paul and Celeste. And church, if you would keep Bud in your prayers and Mary Frances, and, and I would like to just, I may be speaking out of turn, but I'm gonna say it anyway. And, and uh, I'm thankful for you, Cheryl, for helping in this time with Bud and Mary Frances. But keep Bud and Mary Francis and Cheryl in your prayers as they continue to work to bring Bud back to a, uh, an acceptable level with his uh, therapy, etc. Uh, it's been uh, a tough time, tough couple of weeks, so just keep them in your prayer. I would ask that you keep Miss uh, uh, Mary Ann in your prayers as she continues to struggle for her new appointments and such. And I ask church that you will reach out right now with your prayer concerns because Jessica gives them to me and I pray over them and I'll continue to pray over them. And I would just uh, ask that you take this moment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, first and foremost, we are thankful for you. We are thankful for giving us your son and we are thankful for the Holy Spirit, the advocate that you sent to help guide and advise us. What would we do without the Holy Spirit? All we have to do is think it. And the Holy Spirit is that communication, that tunnel, that phone line. <laughs> oh, how many times have I sung Jesus on the main line? It's that phone line, if you will, to the one that can. Church, lift up these people in your prayers. Pray for God's presence in every aspect of their recovery, the operations, and all that will come. And remember this, that the armor that God gives us is too light to even notice, yet stronger than anything that man can build to go against it. Father, we ask that all of this be prayed in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's for his sake. In the name of the Lord, amen and amen and amen. Isn't it great to know, church? That it's not just a word, it's not just a story. It is the truth. And in this time, this trying time, stand on the truth. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. when you go out don't be mean to others that are not but you wear a mask show your respect for everyone stay safe wash your hands you know church we've been going through a lot and surely by now we know that it's not uh, a myth but I assure you of this God's armor will allow us to walk with him and no matter what comes against you, he will be there with you. 
but he gave you free will. So be smart and be safe. Don't blame the sickness on God. Praise the cure. Amen? Amen. We love you, church. We'll see you next Sunday. And I truly believe, even though I have been wrong before, I truly believe we'll be together in August sometime. Amen and amen. And God bless you.